Mm. I'd like an update on um, chronic bronchitis and dynamic airway disease, I guess. Uh. <laughs> the latest. <laughs> yeah, well. I, I knew mean, that one would come up. Yeah. I mean, lower airway disease, that, that, that covers just, <laughs> the, there's whole book chapters written on that. It's a really huge section of the, of the book, absolutely. So what I thought we'd do, rather than try and kind of rush through it, is focus on the non-infectious diseases of the lower respiratory tract today, but then give ourselves next fortnight buffer to talk about any overflow stuff that comes up. And the focus of next fortnight, I thought we could actually do respiratory physiology and get down pretty deep on gas exchange and hemoglobin and... Um, stuff like that, if that's all right with everybody. That sounds like a very good idea. Okay. And we, what I might do as well, having learned the lesson of adding physiology into Edinger, is when we move on to the cardiology sections, which are next, we might do cardiac physiology before we actually go on to cardiac disease. Yeah? Okay. Yes. So learning that's as we go. <laughs> um, okay. So... Airway disease. Does anybody know what causes it? What dynamic airway disease? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, it's a genetic uh, genetic cartilage weakness, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yep. And there's a few a few factors. So genetics, one of them. Do you know of any other um, concurrent conditions which might exacerbate it? Infl anything with inflammation, any type of inflammation. Yeah. And anything that causes a cough. Good. Yeah. Sorry, obesity. Good, Max. Excellent. That was, I didn't think anyone would get that one. Excellent. Good things um, like rapid cephalic airway disease as well, put a bit of extra negative good. pressure. Very good. Yeah. Um, I'm a really sort of visual and conceptual learner. And when I sort of, I, Josh has probably heard my spiel with clients, when I think about an airway, I think that they should be like the old big plastic Macca straws, which if you ran over them with a car, they wouldn't squash. But these these collapsing tracheas are more like the paper straws and you try and suck through them and they get flat and squashed. So the more force you put on them, the more they flatten and squash. So... When you've got a brachycephalic dog, they're creating a lot of suction when they're trying to draw air in, and that's going to draw the trachea flat if it's like a soggy paper straw. Whereas a dog that's got a nice, long, wide open nose and you're not creating that sort of degree of suction, it's not going to collapse quite as much. So it just that brachycephalicness exacerbates a weak trachea. Does That's that interesting because I thought the breeds that, that I've known to have it haven't been brachycephalics, but the brachycephalics have, um, um, oh, what's the term, when you've got the, the trachea is too small. Oh, hyperplastic trachea. Uh, hyperplastic trachea, yeah. 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 When we had a little bulldog pup whose who's, uh, ratio was about five instead of 14 uh, and he came in because well the owner thought he had kennel cough um, so he had probably had a bit of a, an inflammatory complication but that that pushed him over the edge yeah. um so certainly hypoplastic trachea's are more common in pugs and bulldogs or brachycephalic breeds there's almost there's two forms of of collapsing trachea in particular um so this is, this is an almost purely genetic form which tends to present really young. Can anyone tell me what breed is overrepresented in that? Bulldogs, is it? Yorkies? Yorkies? Oh, yes. Who said that? That was impressive. I thought like yeah. dogs like papillons and uh, um, yeah. dogs like that. They're actually, it's overrepresented in breeds we don't see very many of. So I feel At like in Australia, big pattern. At home, it's always a Yorkie. Always Yorkies, yeah. Um, so I did my sort of advanced airway um, intervention training in the US. And that was like Yorkie, 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 Yorkie. And I think I've seen two in my career, really. Um, mm. They're really in, in Hong Kong, it's the Pomeranian. 
Is it? Yeah, really common breed there, commonly obese, and all yeah. in with that honky cough and collapsing trachea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I feel like Pomeranians are overrepresented in our population as well. Okay. That's pretty much what we see them for obesity and airway stuff. Yeah. yeah. And alopecia eggs. Oh, that too. <laughs> I just let the dermatologist deal with that. <laughs> Very luxurious. Um, so the other thing that we haven't mentioned is concurrent heart disease. Um, so we're talking about dynamic airway disease as a whole and, and we've sort of, I want to highlight that that includes both tracheomalacia or floppiness of the trachea as well as bronchomalacia. And most dogs have a degree of both because it's cartilage degeneration. Why would it be selectively just the trachea? Um, having said that, the dogs that present young and early, so the Yorkies and, and the Poms, do tend to have more, are more commonly affected by tracheal collapse. Whereas the older dogs who present with that sort of pure degenerative sort of presentation often have a combination of tracheal and bronchial collapse. Um, so why is that significant? Does it matter if the trachea and the bronchi are both collapsing or if it's just the trachea as far as the therapies that we might recommend? I think trachea you can put a stand, but bronchial may be difficult. Yeah, absolutely. So we do tend to approach these a little bit differently and it is important for us as far as what, are, what options do we have for this dog to identify whether it's purely tracheal collapse or trachea and bronchial collapse. Um, why does heart disease tie in with bronchial collapse? Uh, and last but not the less, left atria can compress on the bronchi. Yeah, excellent, very good. Would an enlarged left atrium compress a normal bronchi that wasn't degenerative? Not to the same degree. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So essentially the force that you should have in that left main stem bronchus, so we've got a really rigid bronchus, that cartilage is pushing, is hold, it should hold stable at a much higher pressure than you can generate in a left atrium shouldn't collapse a normal bronchus. So if we're suspicious of bronchial collapse and um, mitral valve disease or left atriomegaly, there's two conditions there. It's not one causing the other. It might be one exacerbating the other, but um, there's definitely two processes there. I think Josh, Josh might know the answer to this, but why is are so many dogs with bronchomalacia or coughing also, why do they also have much of valve degeneration? Sorry, I'm picking on you. Do you want me to tell you? Yeah, I think I know the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, I can teach you something. Um, so it, we're talking about a degenerative cartilage disease. So degeneration of the cartilage. Now the mitral valve has a cartilage component to it. So when you get degenerative mitral valve disease, you also commonly get degeneration of the cartilage of the airway. So dogs that are predisposed to one are also predisposed to the other. So they're often present together. Um, all right, so how do we diagnose it? I think bronchoscopy is the best way actually. Yeah, agree. That's considered gold standard. You're looking at it, you can gauge what degree of collapse there is in a dynamic situation. So you can make them cough while you're watching. Any other ways? Could get lucky with radiology and see it collapse, but it's a moment in time. It's like, yay, I got it. But yeah, but it's or fluoroscopy even. It's not there. Yeah, yeah. Fluoro. Fluoro is a good call. <laughs> um uh, so fluoro is definitely better than radiographs. Um, rads are really good for the trachea, or you can get away with it for the trachea, but you really can't tell the bronchi, or certainly I can't. I'm sure radiologists have a better chance. But um, mm -hmm. I do have a couple of images I might put up just for points of discussion.
Can you guys see that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is a 12 year old male neutered Maltese who presented in very acute respiratory distress and every breath in you could hear the you could hear the airway closing every time you tried to take a breath in it was really shocking um, the features of this radiograph we can't see tracheal collapse I don't think like we really can't see that the trachea has a big sort of dip in it at all. Um, but we can see down here one, so at the level of the carina, one airway going off this way and a kind of attenuation at this point, which might indicate bronchial collapse. Now, can anyone tell me which if you had a cervical tracheal collapse, selectively cervical tracheal collapse, whether that would present with an inspiratory or expiratory dyspnea? Inspiratory. Good. Excellent. And what about lower airway collapse? Expiratory. Expiratory, exactly. So looking at the respiratory pattern is really important. <laughs> and I thought this dog was weird because it was so definitively lower airway collapse, but it was so collapsed that it couldn't breathe in or out, essentially. Um, I'll move on to the bronchoscopy of this dog if I can. Go for it, Jeff, what were you gonna say? Oh, I was gonna say, was that an expiratory film or an inspiratory one? We always aim for inspiratory, but I'm not sure that we achieve it very often. Um, so in the trachea here, we've got right bronch, we're just going down the left bronchus there and right bronchus over this side. So you can see that that's completely flat. Mm. And it's opening a little bit on inspiration, but it's closing completely down. That's so that main stem bronchus. The bronchi distal to that were actually quite open but obviously, if you can't get air past the, the more proximal bronchi, that's um, pretty useless. Yeah, and on the radiograph, it almost looked like this, it was attenuated, there was dilation. I don't know whether it's, yeah. I, I agree. So bronchi should never, they should always taper as they go towards the periphery. Mm -hmm. And in this dog, they definitely ballooned after that sort of narrowing. Hmm. Um, does anyone know what that's called in humans? Okay, does this no. Yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And that's sort of talked about. We sort of extrapolated that term and put it into animals, but it's not really a sort of a syndrome that's recognised in animals. But in humans, they call it chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Okay. Um, and what what that means, and again, I'm a very sort of visual and tactile learner, but if you sort of imagine, if you sort of close your airway, close your nose, close your mouth and try and breathe out and feel the force that's generated in your chest. So if you then sort of visualise that at the lower air, at the point of the lower airway, so the trachea and the bronchi are full of cartilage, they're pretty rigid, they're not going to balloon out normally. But as you get lower and lower in the airway, the rigidity of the airways drops off. So if you're breathing out against a closed airway or increased resistance, you're going to balloon out the lower airway. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we certainly see bronchiectasis described, particularly in C, much easier to recognise in CT. How might that impact mucus clearance of normal inhaled debris and mucus and stuff? It can't occur. Oh. It you can't, they can't do a normal cough and the mucociliary clearance is also um, abnormal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we end up with these little like dilated balloons full of mucus with plugs and things in them. And sometimes that just renders that whole airway useless, it just blocks it completely. What happens when we've got mucus and stuff sitting around in the body? It's, that's a really poorly worded question, sorry. Um, so 
this is where I guess the overlap between um, dynamic airway disease and chronic bronchitis occurs. So chronic bronchitis, right. we've got a whole heap of mucus, we've got recurrent opportunistic infections, we've got inflammation in the lower airway. And that can result from a, a dynamic collapse of the airway higher up. So there's a little bit of overlap between those two syndromes, despite them being kind of spoken about very distinct, distinctly in text. So I just, we always sort of say, you suppress the cough with dynamic airway disease, you don't suppress the cough with chronic bronchitis, but often we end up having to walk a little bit of a tightrope there. What's the downside of suppressing the cough in a patient with um, chronic bronchitis? Why don't we suppress that? They need to clear the, the mucus, ideally, um, yeah. especially if um, they're predisposed to secondary infection. A absolutely, yeah. So the cough is serving a purpose, and we know the mucociliary clearance is is um, reduced. So the cough is the only thing really that they've got to move that mucus to the to the surface or out of that airway. So if we suppress it, it's just gonna sit in there and fester and it either form a plug, a mucus plug, because it's quite dry in there. It's gonna um, cause like a concretion, um, broncholith uh, eventually, or it's going to get an infection in it. I find that um, respiratory mucosa really interesting just because it's got such a limited way of dealing with inflammation so or any any mucosa really that's got cilia on it so when you get damage to the airway and inflammation of the airway uh, they can't regrow the cilia cells they can only regrow um, mucus producing cells so you end up with more mucus um, and no hairs to move it up to the surface and then eventually you get fibrosis as well which decreases that elasticity in the airways which is required with long movement obviously um all right so what do we do to how do we treat once we've diagnosed these dogs how do we treat them dynamic airway disease not chronic bronchitis sorry <clears throat> you do want to suppress the cough in dynamic airway disease and mm -hmm. if there is an inflammatory component you want to suppress the inflammation as well Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, get weight off them if they're the obese. Very like, good. It makes off that straw. Mm. Yeah, such a huge difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I just had a little pom, and it was that classic obese owner, massively obese dog, and this dog was on its last legs, and she's got two kilos off this fourteen kilo pomeranian. Um, and the dog's completely remission, not coughing at all. It's really remarkable. Um, I should have Hopefully she it. finds that motivating for herself. I know, I know, absolutely. Um, what other medication? Oh, we talked about anti-inflammatory. What anti-inflammatories are we going to use? Something inhaled and targeted to the airways. Good. What would what, what you use, Brian? Flu. Um, flu ticazone. Yes, very good. Excellent. Um, so that's the, probably the ideal scenario is using an inhaled um, steroid. So fluticasone, I think it the I think it's thirty two or higher times more potent than prednisolone. So it's huge, way more concentrated, and because it's not absorbed systemically, you can get way better anti-inflammatory effects locally. Um, so really good in theory but it depends on the patient being compliant, which like it only works if it gets to the lower airways. Mm. And it also depends on the airways not being completely collapsed and the medication getting down to those lower airways in the section, in the affected sections of lung. Um, so there are a couple of, I use it ideally for sure. That's my first option, but there's quite a few patients that we end up not being able to do that. What are our other options? Well, I was thinking my favourite by solvent, but I'm not quite so sure. If it's thick mucus is the problem, yes, it would be helpful. I think so. And I'd, again, use that on a case-by-case -case basis, working out are we dealing more with the dynamic airway disease cough or are we dealing with a chronic bronchitis cough? 
and with bronchitis, bisulfan is, is quite effective in some patients for sure. Um, at anti focus still on the anti-inflammatories. If we can't use fixotide, what would you use systemic prednisolone? Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. What are the downsides of apart from the usual sort of PPD and pushing stuff? You're probably going to worsen your <laughs> cartilage. Yes. Very good. Absolutely. Mm. Um, what else, what other impact does it have, not actually on the cartilage itself, but on tidal volume? Does anyone know? Oh, no. It's a little bit left outside the box, outside the thoracic box. <laughs> it's in the abdomen. <laughs> they, um, their diaphragm musculature becomes weaker, so they can't, um, they, yeah, they can't breathe. Oh, and a fat liver. And a fat liver, exactly. And, you know, humans, we've got gravity in our favour in this regard, but dogs, when they get a fat liver, it pushes on their weight. Like, so you've got the, the diaphragm and if the diaphragm gets weak and the liver gets big, the diaphragm gets pushed cranially by this fat liver and the dog just can't generate the strength to move the liver back with each breath in. So tidal volume reduces in all dogs on prednisolone, um, which is one of the contributors to why they pant. What's one of the other reasons, one of the other impacts on pulmonary function potentially with cortisone? I think vascular. Risk, risk of like, let me see the other box, like pulmonary thromboembolism. Yeah, microthrombia, yeah. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't have very good ways of detecting microthrombi particularly in the lungs. Um, Dave Church, who's a very well-known Australian internal medicine specialist who now works at, um, in Edinburgh College and does research in Cushing's and Cushing's and endocrinopathies, he, he reckons that the whole reason that Cushing's dogs pant is because of microthrombi. He thinks it's hugely a, a really big problem in dogs. Wow. Yeah. And we... You know, these patients already have reduced lung function. It's something that I think we should probably keep in the back of our minds because we don't know what, what we don't know about what mm. in our lungs, essentially. Um, excellent. So we've, we've talked about mucolytics a little bit with the bisolvent. Any other mucolytics we can use? Could you try mucomist? What's that? In oh. their cell system. Yes. I didn't know that was its name, but yes, <laughs> I was not expecting anyone to get that. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, if you give that systemically, it's a really potent mucolytic. It's just bloody expensive is the main downside. And How do you know when you need a mucolytic? Um, really productive coughs. Right. So if they're terminal retch at the end of the cough, doing a big swallow after the cough each time. You can kind right. of hear a moist cough as opposed to a dry, a honking cough. So the character of the yeah. cough is really important. Mm. Um, lung sounds yeah. as well. If what about were... going back to those doggos that you said have the mitral valve degeneration and then they've also got a component of lower airway disease and cartilage disease in the lower airways mm -hmm. fruzamide and drying them out mm -hmm. you find they're the ones that perhaps still have that moist cough but you how do you make that call is this cardiac is this non-cardiogenic it's so hard and yeah most right time, okay most of the time it's treatment trial uh -huh. um so you know if they're pyrexic or obviously developed a pneumonia like if they've had mm -hmm. a, an acute deterioration i find that much easier to tell but um Pulmonary edema. If their respiratory rate, resting respiratory rate is normal, but they've still got a moist cough, would that kind of go, oh, let's use a mucolytic here? Yeah. yeah. I, I would actually. So resting respiratory rate goes up before incidence of cough and things in congestive heart failure mm. because the fluid accumulates in the interstitium and decreases gas exchange before it gets into the alveoli and wells up and triggers a cough. Mm. So you'll see increase in respiratory rate before any of the other signs. 
So if you've got a moist cough but a normal respiratory rate, that's a giveaway that it's respiratory, I reckon. Mm. Okay. Relies on the owner giving you accurate resting respiratory rates from home. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Best, best laid plan. Are there published dose rates for bisulfan in dogs? Yeah, it's uh, two milligrams per kilogram per day divided. Okay, thank you. And that's, that's your go-to oral mucolytic? Oral, yeah. Yeah. It's cool, available thanks. as a liquid um, in two strengths. I think it's four and eight milligrams per five mils, but don't quote me. And it's available as tablets, which are eight milligram. Cool. Um, and, and how do you know if you need an anti-inflammatory in um, dynamic airway disease? Do you always use one? I'm so spoiled because I've usually done a scope and gone, oh, this is mm. mucus here. <laughs> It's really red. <laughs> so um, usually just by sort of visual assessment. Um, I actually usually do the rest of the treatments before I start an anti-inflammatory. I usually try and get away with cough suppression, mucol mucolytic effect. And there's one more medication I use often in dynamic airway disease and chronic bronchitis, actually. Does anyone know what it is? Is that an airway dilator of some description? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, do you know which one? There's not many. <laughs> um, I would use something like Bricanol, which is terbutaline. Or, and what, but what I get confused about in cats, where you can use an inhaler like salbutyrol, albutyrol, but then I heard that that doesn't work in dogs and I haven't had time to do a little search and go, really, is that a thing? Yeah, it's... So, very interesting point, actually. And I think that's a good segue. Let's talk about asthma next. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so cats have bronchoconstriction in a sim like reactive bronchoconstriction. Sorry, my dog being naughty. <laughs> uh, uh, so similar to humans, they get this um, like sort of almost dysfunctional reaction in their bronchi to inhaled, in well, to inflammation, infection, um, smoke, like just this kind of really reactive bronchi and they get active smooth muscle constriction, which constricts the bronchi. And that's where bronchodilators are indicated because you can widen out, you can just inhibit that constriction. Dogs don't, dogs haven't been demonstrated to get that. Um, so they don't have that same reactive bronchoconstriction and asthma doesn't really exist in dogs um, that we know of. So their chronic bronchitis is much more associated with failure of the mucociliary escalator um, rather than bronchoconstriction. Having said that, in humans, we know that tibutaline is responsible. Not only does it dilate the bronchi, it increases mucociliary clearance. But it improves the mucociliary function. We've never demonstrated that in animals, so we don't know. And obviously human airway is very different from dog airways and maybe the mucociliary functions improve because the airways are dilated in humans, which went not really out of thought. So I can't say whether it works or not, but I don't think it's the wrong thing to do. Um, there's another medication, oral medication. I think Sam might have been saying it before. The offload? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, so that's a bronchodilator as well but it has a couple of added benefits too in that it improves the diaphragm strength. So it helps to overcome those sort of limitations and that you know diaphragm being pushed forward, particularly if you're having to reach for an anti-inflammatory, which is gonna kind of offset that. I really like that combination. Um, it also has- you, Was that terbutaline or theophylline? So <laughs> theophylline, yeah. Theophylline, okay, theophylline. yeah. yeah. Tibutal. And that's going to be safer if you've got cardiac, concurrent cardiac disease. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, the other downside of inhaled tibutaline is over time, it can actually cause inflammation. So that's been demonstrated in cats. So you use the idea is that you use Ventolin for an attack when you need acute bronchodilation, but you use like Flixitard or inhaled. Um, anti-inflammatory to minimise the risk of needing to use salbutamol long-term. So they usually don't recommend salbutamol long-term in humans in particular. 
and in cats they've demonstrated that same inflammatory response with chronic use so better off to use a preventative than a um, treatment and is that the same for the long acting cell meterol do you know so in the combined um, inhalers I'm not um, sure. as opposed to say using theophylline orally you could use cell meterol but then it's going to be more like um, your terbutaline um, so yeah. same kinds of drug as tubutylene, isn't it? And it's going to yeah. have more adverse effects. I think so. And you we, you wouldn't get the benefits of the diaphragm strengthening and things because that would rely on that systemic absorption. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Where theophylline has sort of lower side effects, but that added benefit as well. Um, so that's my first choice. And that's actually based on, um, I'm plugging Rita, but Rita did a study in Davis when she was doing her residency looking at the incidence of bronchial collapse in dogs with heart disease and her recommended treatment on the basis of her sort of research was theophylline um, in these patients so she's quite often doing echoes to work out whether it's a cardiac or respiratory cause of cough and in the cardiac ones she gives cardiac meds in the respiratory ones she gives theophylline as her first, first choice so I just copy her um, and another an interesting paper came out looking at an anabolic steroid in, the, in dynamic airway disease called stenozolol. Um, and it improved or resolved cough in 21 out of 22 patients, which I thought was pretty impressive. I don't know what the side effects and things are. I've never used it, but I just think it's some, something interesting. Watch this space. I'll let somebody else do the experimenting. Uh, all right, let's go on to asthma and I'll just see if I've got some pickies. Oh, yeah, that's fun. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Yes. What do you think? Tell me about this x-ray. Jeez. Yeah, wow. Are those like massively expanded main stem bronchi pushing up the trachea? Like, yeah. Yeah. I think it's a buller. All oh, right. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Oh my gosh. So, yes. I mean, a buller is uh, that chronic obstructive pulmonary disease thing that, where the, you know, the bronchi should look like this and then it gets blocked at this point and it goes like that. Mm. So that's exactly what causes a buller. You can it's see it's really hyperinflated. It does. Yeah. Yes. Cool, yes. It? Yeah. Yeah. The heart is so cranial too. It's um, pushed. Yeah, the cardiac silhouette's really cranial in the, in the thorax. It really is. And I'm wondering actually if that buller has sort of almost shifted everything. Like it just yeah. looks like it's... It's pulled things cranially. Is that a fissure line or is that a part of a rib sort of down along the cardiac silhouette from the crown yeah. down? Yeah, there. I think I think it's a fissure line. Yeah. Mm. I think there's a little bit of pleural effusion there. Fluid there. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about this bit? Mm. Yeah. Weird. Are there pneumothorax? Yeah, I think there might be a little pneumo there as well, which is not oh. uncommon in patients with bully. They just come, sometimes pop them. Mm. Okay. Did you say consolidation of the um, Here. total part of the left cranial lobe? I didn't actually say that, but I totally agree. Yeah. I think this is a fissure line. I think there's a little bit of fluid there, but I also think there's a low bar sign here. Mm. Okay. Um, so there's a little bit of everything going on. What do we think about the pulmonary par parenchyma? Severe bronchial. Well, it's fibrotic, I guess. Yeah. Thickened. Yeah, I reckon we've got peribronchial uh, or a bronchial pattern, essentially, So which usually means bronchial thickening, bronchial wall thickening. You can definitely see the donuts and tram lines. Is that what everybody else uses? Mm -hmm. the, the yeah. true sort of line right out to the periphery of the lung. You really shouldn't be seeing bronchial lines right out at the periphery of the lung. So this is obviously really easy to make a diagnosis when you see an x-ray like this. 
in a cat, but obviously in asthma, a lot of the time before you've got that really sort of thickened bronchial wall and um, changes, the x-rays are pretty normal. Sometimes they're hyperinflated, but it's just a, usually a lot more subjective than this is. It's a pretty clear, clear cut. Um, what causes asthma in cats? The etiopathogenesis. Like chronic irritation from smoke inhalation or licking dust. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, can can be that can definitely exacerbate asthma. But do you know what the etiopathogenesis is? Like the underlying um, cause in ninety percent of cats. Guessing like allergic oh, reaction. Very good. Yeah, so it's allergic in yeah ninety percent of cats. Um, so inhaled aeroallergens, we call them, um, most commonly pollens. Um, so often they're seasonal. And can anyone define asthma for me? Nope. Um, an acute allergic reaction that can be reversible with, um, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So the key thing, which is quite different from pretty much every other respiratory disease is that it's intermittent and they can be completely normal for months at a time and then terrible for a week and then back to completely normal, sometimes without any intervention. Um, so at, yeah, asthma is exactly, that's exactly it, King. Um, so even cats with x-rays like this, we sometimes see them, the owners say, oh no, they don't really cough because <laughs> they hide it from us. Um, so given that the etiology of, I mean, asthma is essentially a form of bronchitis, but given it, that it's allergic in origin, what treatment options do we have? Uh, immunosuppressive ther therapy. <clears throat> yep. Good. What, what do we usually use? Corticosteroids. Yeah. Usually a big one to kind of start with. Yep. You're going to go inhaled. Inhaled, ideally. Inhaled. We'll start with systemic and then if they are um, not going to tolerate and then move to an inhaler. Very good. What's the other reason for starting systemic other than tolerance? I guess, mm, I don't know. It shouldn't be more effective, but um, I don't know. Um, if you think about a cat in an attack, what's, what it's bronchia doing? Oh, you're just going to get better absorbed. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, in, you're not relying on actual air movement into the alveoli. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Or out of the alveoli. So when they're constricted, you're just not going to get a medication delivered topically down into the lower airways where we need need to get it. So we often do, in particularly in a crisis, have to start with prednisolone and then move to um, inhaled. And it's behaviour, like we get more time to sort of, you know, start with one breath, do two breaths tomorrow, do three breaths the next day, just work people up to it as well. <coughs> so that's the mainstay of therapy. And then we obviously use bronchodilators um, to in an attack setting. But as I said, it is known to cause inflammation in cats um, if used long-term. So just, just as, as needed, basically. All right, should we move to parenchymal diseases. Let me see what else I've got for you. Um, oh. There's so much I want to talk to you about. <laughs> oh, can I just show this radiograph? So let's talk about this. This is a lateral radiograph in a 12 year old cat who's presented with pyrexia and um, uh, increased respiratory rate and effort. What do you think of the radiographs? Very interstitial pattern, diffusely. Yeah. Yeah. Almost nodular. Hmm. Mm, I agree. Yeah. What are our differentials in this cat? Broad, <laughs> broad categories of differentials. Neoplasia. Infection. Neoplasia. Yeah. Fungal infection. Mm -hmm. Um, infection. Yeah, good. 
Um, this is a really classic um, uh, Toxo lung. It's not Toxo, it wasn't Toxo, but it could easily be her pain, yeah. Mm. Work through your dammit. Dammit V, V. Oh. Vascular. Good. <laughs> what? 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 Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, um, what can cause a really diffuse interstitial pattern in um, the cat lung that is. Like arts? Um, oh, yeah, good. Yeah. It's not, not actually what I was thinking. It's much, something much more common. I saw the name on the uh, uh, the program of the the um, oh uh, yeah and you I called it F no FIP cheating. so no. <laughs> no cheating <laughs> take every bit of evidence that presents yeah <laughs> very observant of you um, what about heart failure could it look like this oh guess it could yeah I always have strangulation. Non-cardiogenic pulmonary uh, near, dr near drowning, yeah, no, you yeah, it's going. Absolutely. <laughs> um, did we say lungworm? We didn't, actually. Good. So we'll put that in our infectious. So para can I say parasitic? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I just thought this was the most amazing case. 12-year-old cat, pyrexic. And it uh, ended up dying. We treated it for, what, six weeks or something, Josh? Yeah. Yeah, about, about that. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, belongs to a vet, of course. Um, and we did a lung biopsy, which came back for, with FIP, immunohistochemistry with FIP. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and really not – it was really – locally lung changes there wasn't anything else really in the cat that was abnormal was there josh in my recollection Any no, no, chemistry really. that was I had a hyperglobulinemia um so we were thinking some sort of hematogenous infection mm. um we aspirated the lung nodules got pyogranulomatous inflammation but um do you remember what its album globulin ratio was anna i don't remember actually do you remember josh no, I don't remember. It was it, it was, was not very amazing though. No, I think the globulins were like sixty or something like that. They weren't over a hundred. And I think yeah. that probably fits like this cat obviously had a compromised immune system to end up in this situation. Um, or a, a deranged immune react response to the virus. But um an adult cat didn't get it as dramatically as a as a young cat did. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just interesting that we should always have it on our list because it can cause quite focal inflammation with no other systemic signs. Um, anyway, we're not talking about infectious lung diseases. So let's go back to the other causes of interstitial pattern because this could, could be a lot of things. Um, what else? What about... Are the vascular causes of lung changes? Like a thromboemboli, but it's not going to be that obvious though, right? Or have you seen um, things? Or? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. It probably isn't going to be this pronounced, but certainly um, if they clot a whole um, blood vessel, like going to the whole lung, you'll see collapse of that whole lung. Then you can certainly see it really patchy looking like this as it collapses sort of thing. Mm. Um, it wouldn't look exactly like this for sure. And most of the time the lung, the radiographs are pretty normal with PTEs. Mm. Um, so let's pretend this is a dog who has um, just had a seizure. Um, what like, like a neurogenic, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Good, excellent. Trick question. What's the mechanism? We don't know. We don't know. Good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We don't really know why this happened. So um, neurogenic, non-cardiogenic edema is seizure, head trauma, and electrocution are the main causes. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't really know what causes it, but all of a sudden the vessels get really leaky. 
Yeah. I think wasn't I think we we're talking about it being as well that there's some belief that there's like massive vasoconstriction. So there's increased hydrostatic pressure or something as well. Is that I didn't actually I didn't know. Oh, I thought you were not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I forget things day on day, so it could have easily have been. Um oh yeah, we were. <laughs> Sorry. I think it was a while ago though. Yeah. yeah. Um so we don't really know what etiology is. So normally, what are the other causes of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Uh, an overwhelming inflammation, like severe pancreatitis or something like that. Very good. Yeah. So systemic inflammatory disease. Strangulation. Did we talk about that? We, we didn't actually, but that is one. Yeah. Um, I didn't catch that. Uh, strangulation. Strangulation. Yeah, so upper respiratory obstruction. So either externally strangulation or actually um, choking. Put knee drowning under that. Good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a different mechanism. Mm -hmm. So knee drowning is usually an aspiration mm -hmm. um, causing direct lung injury. So it washes the surfactant yeah. out of the lungs and the lungs rub on each other and they get annoyed. Okay. Um. So near drowning. Regulopathy in there, just thinking outside the box. like Very good, yeah. Not as a cause of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, but coagulopathy could definitely present like this um, radiograph. Um, Decreased lymphatic drainage. Very good. Are you cheating? No, I just studied this recently. <laughs> 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 that was amazing. So, I don't know if that's cheating, but <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, so the other, let's think about. We sort of covered the neurogenic causes. The, so my categories: I do neurogenic causes, and then systemic diseases, which is like an indirect lung injury, like inflammation elsewhere, getting deposited in the lungs because they're tiny vessels and they collect a lot. And then direct lung injury. So we've talked about aspiration. There's other other things that I want to mention while we're. Well, kind of irritant. I had a cat once with silicosis. Yeah. On a BAL. That was, and then they were like, oh, yeah, you know, we, it's a rag doll. He's not scared. And, and we work with marble and stone and stuff. I was like, oh, wow. Wow. Mm. Was the, what were the radiographs like? Um, quite, not unlike this, not quite as severe. Mm. And he presented for vomiting and then in the consult he was coughing. You know how some clients get mixed up between a coughing cat and a vomiting cat? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like, whoa, hang on, he's coughing. And then the radiographs were this sort of mixed interstitial cum nodular pattern with some bronchial pattern as well. Yeah. The BAL came back as silicosis. I'm like, oh. Yeah, wow. I'll try and dig them out if you're interested. Yeah, that's a cool case. Hmm. It was very cool. Not for the cat. No. Did it not go well? Uh, we just treated him with anti-inflammatories and bronchodilators and, you know, he he couldn't care. He went into these sort of paroxysms of coughs, but otherwise he was okay. Hmm. Lovely raggy. Um, and then that went back to the referring vet, so I haven't heard. So um, It's just the trouble with referral. Yes. <laughs> um, uh the, another thing that can cause direct lung injury is oxygen toxicity. Mm. Mm. So it's not something that we see very often in patient, our patients because they're not on 100% oxygen for very long. So we just do short anesthetics and things. But particularly with ventilation, if they're going to be on for more than 48 hours, there is a, a risk that the ventilator-induced um, pneumonia or ventilator-induced lung injury will occur. And a lot of that is not just mechanical trauma but actual the effect of the oxygen. Um, and I once knew the mechanism of that, but now it escapes me. One of the potent causes of that is the uh, the bird ventilator. Yes. It, it, uh, even on air mix, it's still producing 90-odd percent oxygen. Yeah, and it's, a, it's generating, it's quite harsh in the way that it inflates the lungs. So there's mechanical trauma as well as 
the oxygen. Um, so it's not often we're ventilating for more than 48 hours, but it is something just to be aware of. I just remembered what the mechanism was. <laughs> so oxygen causes vasodilation in the pulmonary circulation. Um, I'm not sure how that ends up causing leaky vessels. Ignore me. I don't remember the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> Because the opposite is, uh, the reason it's so relevant is because the opposite is true in that a lack of oxygen causes vasoconstriction. And that can then contribute to exacerbating, like if there's a PTE or something like that, and there's no oxygen in the circulating blood, and then the blood vessels vasoconstrict. So it almost like steamrolls itself, it decreases the perfusion to a lung load. Um, the, so. Um, we've done neurogenic, we've done systemic disease, we've done direct lung injury, which actually I should put contusions on there as well. So trauma. Um, and yes. be pardon? Um, impaired lymphatic drainage and then upper respiratory tract obstruction as these causes. Um, so they're my categories of non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And this could easily, so the typical pattern of non cardiogenic pulmonary edema is this dorsal um, increased opacity. Uh, so this could easily be a non cardiogenic pulmonary edema if that was, if that was, um, with history was consistent with that. What about, can we talk just quickly about eosinophilic bronchopneumonia? It's a disease of dogs. Do we know what causes it? I think it's uh, immune mediated. Good, excellent. Yeah. Um, so it's usually there's usually a trigger for it. So there's been an infection or an aeroallergen or something set it off, but it's this dysregulated overreaction to whatever set it off. What do the radiographs look like typically? nodular interstitial pattern very good yeah they can look for all the world like multiple lung masses so they that's one of the differentials for a really diffuse nodular pattern we can sometimes see masses in isolation so just a big kind of eosinophilic granuloma um sometimes we see just bronchial pattern so they can just look like a you know coughing dog with pretty normal radiographs because they're, they're usually quite acute so we haven't got that really profound thickening of the bronchi yet. Um, how would we diagnose this? Uh, BAL. Yeah, good. Would there be any hints on our CBC or um, gloves? I've only seen one and it had a peripheral eosinophilia as well. Yeah. Um, we looked for heartworm and lungworm and all that sort of thing, and it wasn't there. And then it had a nodular pattern and the eosinophilic infiltrate on the BAL. Yep. Um, Anna, I'm just interested in BALs versus uh, tracheal washes, because uh, I think the BAL probably works best when you can jam the scope into a, a bronchus well down yep. and then sort of pump the fluid in and out because... Mm -hmm. Many a time I've done a BAL with a scope and not got much and then found a lot of mucus on the endotracheal tube. Mm -hmm. It was beautifully presented by the mucociliary apparatus. Yeah. So um, I wonder whether the uh, tracheal wash might not be just as effective and less invasive. Yeah, probably less invasive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... BALs I find really frustrating. So I find we rarely get as much mucus as we did as we would with a sort of general wash. So what I typically do if again I'm spoilt, so often we're doing our bronchoscopy immediately after we've done a CT. So if I've seen quite focal change if I'm trying to culture a focal aspiration ammonia with one lobe affected or something like that, I'm going to jam my scope down there and get a, a local sample because I want 
a representative sample of where the pathology was. But if I see quite diffuse changes on my CT or radiographs for that matter, if it's not localized, I'm going to do a blind wash. I want to get a general idea of what the cell populations are in the lung as a whole. And I'm going to get a bit better representation of that by doing a blind wash. Um, I virtually never do targeted BALs in cats just because of the limitations of the scope occupying the whole trachea and the, the risk of that, um, as opposed to doing a, a, a wash essentially. So tra tracheal wash is needle through the trachea, technically the sort of the procedure, whereas a modified bronchial wash which is what I typically do is put a sterile ET tube in, put a sterile rigid urinary catheter down the middle of the ET tube until I feel it touch something. And then I come back a tiny bit. <laughs> and then I put whatever volume I think is appropriate for the patient, but usually a pretty low volume into the tube. And I have them on quite a light plane of anesthetic. So they're often coughing. So you stand with your face to the side so that you don't wear it and then draw back um, through the catheter. And then once I've done two of those, depending on how stable the patient is, sometimes three, I'll then tip the patient over the edge of the table and catch what comes out of the ET tube in a separate pot. And I use a separate pot for my cytology. So I've caught all of the stuff that's run out and it's caught all of the stuff that the mucociliary escalator mechanism has presented and it's run out the end of a sterile ET tube and nothing non-sterile has touched the end of that ET tube. So I'm happy that the with the cytology of, on that one and then I'd use the other one for my culture. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes, yeah. it does. Yeah. What um, sort of volumes would you use? And I've uh, only ever gone by rule of thumb and I'm some... There isn't, there isn't really a rule. Um, there should be, but there, there's everybody you I've asked has had a different volume and there's certainly published volumes, but they are per kilo volumes. And I, you know, you get up to a 30 kilo dog, I'm not going to put 30 mils in there, whereas I am going to put five mils into a five kilo cat kind of thing. Um, so I typically range between, th if I'm doing a targeted BAL, I do really small volumes because you, you don't need much. Um, and you, you, you're running the risk of overinflating that lung lobe if you're jammed in the bronchus. So I use potentially two mils, but with a, a wash like that, I'll use three to 10 mils depending on the size of the patient. And I'll do it a few times. The, the other thing is to just give aliquots of small amounts until you get a result. That's exactly what we do, or until the patient decompensates, basically. Um, we usually don't go more than three, but if I know there's stuff down there and I'm not getting it out, I sometimes do. Um, we better wrap up, guys. We will be talking about respiratory physiology in two weeks' time. What I might do is um, send out a good reference for that because it's not really covered in Edinger and then everybody can kind of get on the same page and we can talk about it um, in a couple of weeks. If there are any other diseases that you want to cover, in that because we should have a fair bit of time i would hope to go through them then more than happy to do that pulmonary hypertension i think is probably a good one to tie in with physiology mm. awesome thank you right. very much cheers guys Ooh, thank, thank you, you so much thanks thanks, thanks. 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 thanks.